we thank you for tuning in to our weekly Bible class. And we trust that God has been with you since we last were together. And we're asking that you continue to pray for us as we pray for you. And as we endeavor to open his word, we ask God to take full control. Let us pray together. Holy and everlasting Father, we thank you. First of all, for being our sovereign creator, meaning that you're the ruler of heaven and earth and you're in control of everything that we see and know about. And Lord, as we open up your word today, Father, we ask you to open up our understanding, Father. And Lord, we ask you to let your word have free course, Father. Lord, let your word encourage the believers and convict those who have not accepted you, Father knowing that you're not willing that anyone should be lost, Father. And Lord, enable us to be the vessel that you can use today. And Lord, let the word, word be planted deeply in our hearts. Thank you for leaving it here as a roadmap for us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are in Paul's letter to the Romans. And this particular book deals with salvation primarily. And there are many different truths that our faith is found, founded on. You know, it's many different foundations of our faith that we're, we're opening up. And so we're going to continue to endeavor to understand and interpret his word in its purity. This particular chapter takes up what chapter 7 left off. Chapter 7 uh, dealt with the battle that Christians have to wage against living up to the imputed righteousness that we received through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We received salvation through the sacrifice that Jesus made. And Paul is letting us know today that uh, those of us who have been born again have answered the call of God. He's letting us know that, it, that this battle that we're facing, he said, when, when I would do good, evil is always present. The things that I want to do, I find myself not doing those things. And, and then he let out an anguish cry. He said, oh, wretched man am I. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Then he gives us the answer. He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We can win this battle with sin through our faith and empowerment of our God. And so we are freed from the penalty of sin. Paul starts out this particular chapter asking the question, who is who, who can condemn? Even Christ, when he was here, he said he didn't come to condemn, but he came to save. So we are not condemned because Jesus freed us from the law of sin and death. He came into the, the this world in the flesh just like we are wearing. Only he had the blood of his father running through his veins. And he was tried and he was tempted. And he completely kept the law that God gave to us. The law was God's, uh, his righteousness, what God wanted us to be. And no man was able to keep that law. And But we needed someone because we offended God in the flesh. And Jesus came in the flesh. And he witnessed this existence. But he never messed up. He never sinned. He, he constantly stayed in full communion with his Father in heaven. And that tells us that we won't, we're going to be successful in this, ba this battle with sin. We're going to have to stay close to God. So when Jesus died and when he he went to hell in our place, and when he, he rose from the dead, he gave us victory. The last victory was death, and he defeated death. 
And so now we're we're free from the penalty of sin. He bared our penalty on the cross. He, God put all of our sin upon Jesus and he took his anguish out on him and, and we received a perfect sacrifice that caused us to be free from our sins. But since we've been given righteousness, not because we are righteous. Remember I said we're still fighting this battle. But we are now in a process of sanctification, which is involves us being transformed into the image of God. The only way that we can live righteous and walk is by walking in the spirit of God. You see, Satan is always trying to keep us from being what God has called us to be and given us. He comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. And let me open that up a little bit. When a Christian, one who is supposed to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, is acting as crazy as those who don't know God, Satan is stealing our influence in the world. He, the Bible said that Salt is lost as savor. It's no more good for anything else but to be trodden under the foot of men. When we are doing everything that we know is wrong, we, we actually kill our relationship with God. Not that he ever go away from us, but Satan will cause us to feel like that we don't have a right to even come to God. He still kill and destroy. He destroy our power. But we ought to try to live for the Lord because he died for us. And because we're reminded in scripture that our bodies are the temple of the Lord. When we accept Jesus Christ as our personal savior, God himself through his spirit comes into our bodies and to live inside of us. And we have all that we need to help us to win this battle. Paul said that uh, we have the victory in Jesus Christ. We gotta learn how to crucify our flesh that the Holy Spirit might have free course in our lives. So we have a new position before we were alienated because of our sins from God. But now we have become children of God. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That's a, that's, a, that's a precious thing that God has given us. Can't you imagine God himself? God, it, Jesus was God wrapped up in the flesh. He was all God and all man. And, but when he came and when he died and when we accepted his free gift of salvation, we became the children of God and we are joint heirs with Christ. When Christ come into his inheritance, we were inherited with him. Because we accepted this free gift, that means that we're called by God. We accepted this call. Every man is called by God, but those of us who answer the call, we are, we are God's called and we are justified. God, and, it, and all this is God's work. No man can claim that he's done anything to deserve salvation. Our salvation is a, is a free gift from God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we're called, we're justified, and we will be glorified by God. We are saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin. We are in the process of sanctification. We ought to be closer to God. Some of the things that you used to do, you ought to have the power to resist those things now. But one day, when it's all over, when we leave this sinful flesh, we'll be completely saved from the power of sin. Sin will no longer tempt us. So that's where we left off last week. We are the children of God, joining us with Christ. And, and so now we're going to continue this study in verse 31 of the eighth chapter of Romans. Paul said that those, the verse 30 said, Whoever, whom, moreover, whom he did predestinate, 
them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And to whom he justified, them he also glorified. So now he starts this next phase with asking some questions. He asks, who shall then say, what, what shall we then, we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? That is some good news. He is saying, if God, the one who created us, the one who redeemed us, is for us, who can be against us? The truth that the believers have, this says that the believers have eternal salvation completely secured in God's hands. So not because, once again, that we did it ourselves. We, we didn't earn salvation. The Bible said, lest any man should boast. So we can't boast about a gift. So when someone gives you something, you can't boast about, I, I earned this. No, you received it. So we have eternal salvation in God's secure hand. Jesus said, uh, when we believe in him, we, we are in his hand and no man can pluck us out of his hand. And he said, my father is greater than I am and nobody can pluck you out of my father's hand. So who can lay, who can, if God is for us, who can be against us? And then he said, if he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us, how should he not with him freely give us all things? Now, that, that's not saying that he's going to give you everything that you want. But that's saying he's going to give us everything that we need for salvation. So he's saying, if God be for us, who can be against us? Now, let's, let, let, let's open that up a little bit more now. Who can be against us? In Ephesians, the sixth chapter, it tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against the rulers of darkness and high places and spiritual wickedness and high places. So we, what this is saying is that the person that's giving you hell, that body is not really your enemy, but it's the spirit that's influencing that person that's the one that's, that's your real enemy. I can feel sorry for those who are, I'm trying to be nice to and they're constantly working against me because they are spiritually sick. And you don't hate a sick person. You, you feel sorry for them. But those who try to afflict a Christian, there's something wrong with them spiritually because Satan is our real enemy. And he is constantly trying to do things that's against us. He comes as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So we don't have to worry about him, though, because once again, he said, if God be for us, who can be against us? So what that tells me is that we are worrying and we are fretting and we are concerning ourselves, getting the ulcers. When God has given us the victory, he said, who can be against us? He might make charges against us. He might uh, try to discourage us, but God is for us. And so when we have the one that has all power in his hand for us, 